In today's episode of Trek in Time, we're going to be talking about what happens when your new best friend does you dirty. That's right. We're talking about Enterprise Season 3, Episode 13, Halfway Through the Season, Proving Ground. Welcome to Trek in Time, where we're talking about every episode of Star Trek in chronological order, and we're also talking about the context of what the world was like at the time of original broadcast. We're currently in the third season of Enterprise, which means we're also talking about 2004. Who are we? Well, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And alongside me is my younger brother, Matt, who is that Matt Farrell of (laughs) Undecided with Matt Farrell. And Matt Farrell, how are you today? Matt Farrell is good today. How about you, Sean Farrell? I'm doing okay. (laughs) Looking forward to chatting about an episode that felt just quick, big picture, a bit like the perfect mix of action, talking, and all around Star Trek. How did you feel about it? Just a short synopsis. I loved this episode. (laughs) (laughs) As usual, before we get into discussing the most recent episode, we like to share some comments on our previous episodes. So Matt, do you want to jump into what people have been saying about what we've been saying? Well, on Chosen Realm, which was the last episode, which was about the, the religious extremists that took over the Enterprise... There was a lot of uh, interesting comments around religion and how the show handled it and how we discussed it. And one of them was from PaleGo69. He he laid out a very long, thoughtful comment. I'm just going to focus on the last paragraph. I'd Mm -hmm. recommend anybody go and look at it and read the the whole comment. But he ended it with, one last thing, while you may consider the war over scripture details to be a punchline, it is in fact a very real thing that has happened throughout human history. Many worshiped the same gods by different names, And they would fight each other out just because they could use different mouth noise to refer to the same deity. Not to mention the countless Protestant versus Catholic wars. It's also worth noting that many religious wars were about expanding power than who was right. But that brings into a philosophical discussion about the winner's right history and might makes right versus truth, which may start an existential crisis about what about all of human existence and everything that you know about life. I thought that was a very... Yeah. <laughs> well put. Agree 100% on that. Yeah. Yes. I think we I think in our discussion we kind of viewed that moment of the depiction of the different religious aspects as like the very tail end of the, of a dog we didn't like. We were both like that like th- they didn't give us enough to mm-hmm. really be able to take this with any kind of seriousness, but Ghost is absolutely right. You could tell a very compelling story that starts with that kind of simple difference, but then dig down into it to get to the kinds of things that Ghost yep. talks about. I don't feel yep. like that episode did any of that. So, yeah. But yeah, Ghost is absolutely right. Uh, I like this comment from AJ Chan. He wrote, I was surprised that this episode of Enterprise didn't paint faith in a redeeming light because Enterprise is the only Star Trek show to mention faith multiple times per episode. I mean, just listen to that theme song. And he Mm -hmm. wrote out the the theme song lyrics because I've got faith of the heart. I'm going where my heart will take me. I've got faith to believe I can do anything. I've got strength, the soul, and no one's going to bend or break me. I can reach any star. I've got faith. I've got faith, faith of the heart. And it's funny that the... It's yeah. the theme of the freaking show and yeah. the way that they basically took a dump on faith in that episode is like, what? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a dissonance. I love that AG Chan pointed it out. There absolutely the is a comment, dissonance there. Yeah. Yeah. The last comment I want to bring up is from Robotrav. Uh, he said, I'm intrigued by your response to this episode. Personally, I saw it as an important message about the dangers faith and religion and anti-science culture poses to a society. I saw Archer is fighting for ration and reason against irrational, unreasonable people. I guess it all comes down to your perspective. I just can't help but think that having faith to the extent that you're fully willing to ignore or erase acquired knowledge to maintain an ignorance-backed belief is a very dangerous thing. And I want to kind of cite this one because it's like, my whole channel is kind of about that. (laughs) My undecided YouTube channel. Yeah. Like the breaking the myths around EVs and that EVs are the, a path forward, solar power, dealing with all the ignorant thoughts about that, having our former president say that wind turbines cause cancer. It's like 
there is so much people of people putting their ideology ahead of truth and reason happening mm -hmm. right now in our society. It is scary, damaging, and terrifying that we can't have, we can't agree on what truth is because yeah. there's a prevalence of belief over <laughs> rational thought right now. Yeah. I, I also like Robo Trav's comment. I think that it, it, one of the things that I was hoping would come out through our discussion was that we are not against what he's looking for in mm -hmm. his comment, that kind of depiction of like, there's a point where perhaps faith has to open a door to reasoned scientific arguments. Yep. yep. This episode didn't do that though. It felt like this episode was taking a, a club to faith, not because it countered science, but simply because, well, the faith based people are idiots. And that was, that felt like that's where that episode was coming from for me. So again, I'm, I'm all on board with that kind of discussion. And I think Star Trek has had that discussion many, many times and done it yes. really well. The episode we discussed last week was just didn't feel like one of them. And now that signal in the background, that can only mean one thing. That's the read alert. And Matt, I know I've told you to buckle up before, yeah. but this one's going to take some. I have one recommendation for you. Forget everything okay. you know about grammar. Forget everything you know about <laughs> sentence structure. Oh, no. And just read the words. Just okay. go with the words. Good let luck. The, let the words flow through me? Yes. Okay. Proving Ground is the 13th episode from the third season of the television series Star Trek Enterprise. It's the 65th episode of the series, first airing on January 21st, 2004. This is a science fiction episode about a spaceship dealing with an attack on Earth by aliens in the 22nd century. The episode continues the Zindi story arc, opening with a montage of scenes from the previous shows. <laughs> Archer and a recurring character, the Endorian Captain Tran, take on the Zindi in an uncertain alliance. <laughs> Sorry. I'm glad that they even put a comment about the previously on series yes. of clips. Yes. That's super the important. The synopsis, okay. including that the episode had a synopsis. It gets a little meta there for a little bit. It's, it's, an, it's a conception with the world it is. folding in on us. So. Yeah, it's just, it's just like suddenly, like who put this here? So this episode is from season three, episode 13. It's directed by David Livingston. This is one of the 60 episodes that he's directed during this period in time. It's written by Chris Black. And as Matt mentioned, originally aired on January 21st. 2004 guest stars included Molly Brink as Lieutenant Talis, Randy Oglesby as Degra, Scott McDonald as Commander Dolem, Tucker Smallwood as the Zindi Primate Counselor, Rick Worthy as Janar, Granville Van Dusen as the Andorian General, Jeffrey Combs, of course, as Commander Shran, and Josh Drennan as Degra's assistant. What was the world like when this episode aired? Well, in this very first part of January, 2004, we were still dancing to Hey Ya yeah by Outcast, And at the movies, well, along came Polly. It earned $27 million. The Ben Stiller and Jennifer Aniston gross out comedy is still available for streaming on stars, despite the fact that it is not well rated. So you are warned if you decide to go out and check that one out. And on this evening, on January 21st, 2004, what was Enterprise up against? Well, it was losing. It was mm -hmm. losing against my wife and kids, and it's all relative. It was losing against 60 Minutes 2, which was looking at, among all things, a new story about a virus deadlier than SARS. There's no <laughs> such thing, Matt. <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. Ah, uh, 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 pandemics. Ah, uh, yes. And on Fox, American Idol was getting almost 30 million viewers, which is a bit more than Enterprise's 3 million viewers. And on NBC, The Apprentice, Cough, Cough, in its second <clears throat> week and on WB Smallville was earning a solid 5 million. And in the news, well, I wanted to share this, which is a book review, which was published in September of 2004 at JSTOR, which is a journal storage facility online run by a group, a nonprofit group, which 
has the goal of providing journal entries permanently stored online in perpetuity for future need. And I want to share this opening paragraph of a book review. It's titled The Worst of Enemies, The Best of Allies, a review by Ronald Krebs of the Department of Political Science at the University of Minnesota. And it is his review of Dangerous Alliances, Proponents of Peace, Weapons of War by Patricia Weitzman, which came from the Stanford University Press in 2004. He writes, Patricia Weissman's Dangerous Alliances begins with an oft-neglected insight about the nature of alliances. Alliances often are often not just, and sometimes even not primarily, a means of aggregating power to balance the members' common foreign threats. They may be designed in the first place as devices to manage conflict among the members, to control an adversary by enmeshing it in an institution that is mutually constraining. Alliance motivated by this tethering imperative, to use Weissman's term, is oriented more internally than externally. Not surprisingly, such alliances are not terribly cohesive because the internal threat often exceeds the external threat. Dangerous alliances identify several motivations for alliance formation and elucidates the consequences of each for alliance cohesion. But the book's distinctive contribution lies in its discussion not of balancing or bandwagoning terms that have long been part of the international relations lexicon, but of tethering. I thought that this was a fascinating introduction to the entire concept of the Federation. Mm -hmm. And this episode in particular ties into this concept. If you look at this episode with the idea of tethering in mind, you can see the ongoing tension between earth and Vulcan. And now you can see the introduction of the Andorians into this tethering. The Andorians show up, say, we're only here to help, but what are they really looking for? Well, they're looking for that one planet killer weapon that could keep the Vulcans off their back. Despite the fact that the Vulcan on board the ship would be the first to tell you, yeah, we don't really want anything from them. Mm Mm-hmm. So I thought that was a very interesting concept, and I'd like to keep it in mind as we move forward through Enterprise and perhaps even through, it's an interesting lens to look at Star Trek as a whole because the Federation, there was recently an episode of Strange New Worlds, which actually makes the argument of tethering. Yes, it does. In the effort to get a neutral planet to align with with the Federation instead of the Klingons. And in that episode, the captain of the enterprise, captain Pike says by joining us, you're going to be destabilizing your relationship with the Klingons. And it's going to probably play out with some antagonism, but we need that because you going to their side is worse for us. That's tethering in action. So very interesting idea set up in this book. And I thought that, Dr. Krebs's review was a great introduction to this episode. So as I mentioned at the, at the head of the episode, I thought that this one did a lot of things really well, excluding the, what felt like an overly long and detailed previously on, which I felt like, my goodness, are we ever going to get out of this previously on once we did? And the episode starts, but on that note, They had to do that because they've had so many episodes which had nothing to do with the main plot line. Yeah. And you and I, for the past couple episodes, have been bagging on those episodes that had very little to do with the main plot line because they were lackluster. Felt like padding. Yeah. They didn't do that. They wouldn't need this previously on. Yeah. If this season was 12 episodes instead of 26 or 24, whatever it is, this episode would have, this episode likely would have followed right on the heels of the episode where they introduced the mining facility where the material that is used in the construction, where they met the scientist who had no idea that he was helping to build a super weapon and they got his assistance and his promise to like, I will do what I can to stall this project. And you see the fruit of that. Now it, 
the story literally opens with Hoshi suddenly magically being able to say, Hey, I was able to find that trail we lost. (laughs) It's like, wow. Like all those episodes in between literally could have been pulled out and you would have missed nothing. You would have missed nothing. So maybe what we're looking at is a sign of why TV shows and series are built a little bit differently today, like more consolidated. Let's tell some stories that can be told in 10 to 12 episodes instead of really trying to figure out how we fill 24. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So we, we see the Andorians gallivanting about the expanse. Apparently they've got some tech that allows them to just completely avoid being affected by the anomalies that litter all of the expanse. They weren't willing to share that technology. (laughs) I got the impression it was something like it it doesn't allow them to fly through it, but it allows them to fly around it. Like they may be able to detect them in a much better way. And they hinted at that in the episode because their sensors are a lot more (laughs) sensitive than the enterprises. Yeah. And they show that where they keep several different times where Shran shares their long range sensors with yeah. the enterprise so they can see what's going on off in the distance. And it's like, okay, they're way more advanced than the uh, Starfleet at this point. Yeah. So we see the Andorians coming into the storyline and they show up with, there's a certain amount of tension within the Andorian ship around what they're doing here, why they're still here and whether the humans could possibly have even survived this long. Another nice Shran moment where he says, don't underestimate these people. They're, Mm -hmm. they're, you know, going to be a a lot more tenacious than you give them credit for. And when they finally catch up with the enterprise, it couldn't be at a better moment because the enterprise finds itself in a position where they are, they've gone in, to a place where they can't get out. They they've tried following the trail that will lead them to what turns out to be the testing grounds of the weapon, but they've gotten themselves trapped in a bunch of anomalies, which begins to raise a question, which continues to lurk in the background here. The anomalies, the creation of the anomalies from the spheres. Is there a reason that the anomalies are so much more impactful in this region of space. Are the Zindi somehow using that to their advantage? Is it related to what the Zindi are doing and experiencing? So all of these questions continue to lurk in the background, but what we end up with is the Andorians swooping in to save the day, so to speak, pulling the enterprise out of danger. And then the enterprise and the Andorian ship work together. And we end up with a story that is effectively masterfully two stories at once. I really liked the screenplay for this one. I think Chris Black wrote a really great story that manages to two birds with one stone throughout the entire thing. It is both about what are the Zindi up to? How dangerous is this thing? How can we stop them? And at the same time, are these friends? Or are these people working for their own goals? And yep. the entire scene with Shran basically calling out to Paul for having to resign her commission in order to remain on the ship. The three of them having a three-way conversation around like, why are you even here? What are you doing yeah. here? Like everybody's pointing a finger at everybody else and saying, well, what's your reason for being here? You don't really have a reason either. And it creates tension that doesn't feel like tension at the beginning. And as the episode continues, you end up feeling that tension, like the, the two plots effectively swap positions. It's really yes. masterfully done that by the, at the beginning, it's the Zindi are the problem. Oh my God, here comes some Andorians. And the end of the episode is like, these Andorians are a problem. Yeah. What about the Zindi? And I loved how that was, I loved how that was constructed. Yeah. And how they, how they established in the beginning, the, the questioning of like, why are the Andorians willing to risk so much to come help us? And they fairly quickly. And I think deftly kind of answered that by basically setting up the Andorians hate the Vulcans so much. It came, it came across as 
we want to help the humans because we see the humans as a potential ally against the Vulcans. So it's right. like in the very first 10, 15 minutes, you get the sense of, okay, that's why they're here. But the really good storytelling was over the following 10, 15 minutes after that, they keep pushing things a little further of like, uh, that doesn't f- quite feel right enough. And it's like, oh no, something is a little off here. Yeah. So by the, it's it, like you mentioned how they not only swipped the, swapped the A and B storylines, the way that they just slowly ratcheted it up, the Andorian storyline, it felt very natural and it felt very, in its own right, a little bit of a thriller in its own right, because it was like something's not quite right here. So when things did turn, it didn't feel like a left turn in Albuquerque where it's like, what is going on with the storyline? It felt very natural, natural, organic where we ended up and why we ended up there, where other short, other episodes may have taken like shorthand solutions for that and didn't mm-hmm. suddenly just rip the bandaid off and you would have felt like you were like what is happening right now yeah never felt lost plenty of action really good character development on top of all of that I, I loved it yeah i also thought it was really well done from the perspective of one of the things you can do when you're watching a show like star trek is analyze it from the perspective of who's wearing the white hats who's wearing the black hats by the end of yep. this episode everybody's wearing a gray hat and i thought yep. that it was at the beginning of the episode in particular, a really good use of a lot happens in this episode. So they had to use a lot of shorthand at the very beginning, which came across as a little bit weak in the storytelling. Like the first 10 minutes was pretty obviously like, oh, they're trying to get a lot of ideas out in front of us quickly. And the way Mm -hmm. that that's presented is a little bit of a, cartoonish method like Shran's first officer is cartoonishly pushing back on why are we here why are we going to work with these people she's she's hooking up with reed and is like you stupid humans and he's like you stupid andorian so that they can come together by the end and have a mutual respect grow i have especially appreciated the fact that Reed didn't at any point say, so how about we have sex, which I feel like in previous seasons, there would have been a little bit more of a smarminess to his response to her. Reed's grown up. (laughs) Yeah. In this one, I really appreciated the fact that Reed's response to her was just like, she's done some things that really are like very helpful and have really moved this along in a, in a great way. But the, the, I, I, the, I, the elements, I was just going to say the elements at the very beginning of the episode, which felt a little cartoonish and one dimensional, I think was so that they could have the time toward the end yeah. to really flesh them out because all of that stuff disappears. It becomes, she Pretty moves quickly. away from being the black hat. Shran moves away from being the white hat. They all move toward a sort of gray middle area, even Archer. I think by the end of the episode where he's like, look, and I loved the turn of, yeah, while you were letting us use your long range sensors, we got information you weren't aware of. Okay. So that, that ties into something that I thought was, I, I agree with you. There was some shorthand taken at the very beginning and yeah, I, I don't know if I would agree with the term cartoonish, but it felt, I don't know. I, I, I forgave it because it so quickly got to a place with the gray hat analogy you're using Mm -hmm. that I liked so much. And part of that was with the read and the, what was her name? The security officers, the Andorian security officer, the relationship between the two of them was interesting where she was Lieutenant Talus by Molly Brink, who I thought did a very good job in the episode. Yeah. So Shran and Talus come in and they're basically both of them separately are like, we were technologically superior to the enterprise. But there was some, there was a great line that Talus said maybe two thirds of the way in to read. It's not the technical superiority of the weapon. It's the person who's using it. Right. And I thought that was such a great line to drop because that is the humans and the, the, the Starfleet that is, that is summarizes. They may be outclassed, but the humans are, are very, you know, tenacious thinking outside the box, finding solutions that are really good, which is the ending where Shran's like, oh, we're going to take this thing. We got shields. We can, you know, we can take the weapon and put it at our bay for you. We've got shields that will protect the radiation, which you can't do. We're going to help you out. And then they try to steal it. And here's the humans. 
we were ahead of you guys. We knew you were up to something. We saw that you were trying to take down our sensors and we fixed it quickly. We knew that you were going to probably try to pull something. And guess what? We knew something you guys never even figured out with your fancy sensors. We know how to turn it on remotely. Click. Right. You know, I thought that was such a great, a fantastic like execution of what Talus said to read. It was so great that it's like they got completely outclassed by the humans because of how they approached the entire scenario, which is another reason I like the ending. The v- We're jumping all around the episode, but which the, I think is fine the, given the yeah. Yeah. The type of episode it was the ending where at the very end they get a coded message, what looks like subspace noise. And it was clearly Shran sending a message of the high resolution scans they got of the weapon when Mm -hmm. they had it in their bay that he's sharing with the, uh, the enterprise so that they can do what they need to do to try to save their own people. And I just, it, it, and the fact that the captain made the comment of like, you know, like I've got some Indorian ale, you know, let's, 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 let's yeah. celebrate this. It's, it shows that he's not holding a grudge against Shran. He knows, right. he knows why they did what they did. He understands that they were looking out for themselves, but they're not the big bad. It's yeah. a, it's a con, there's a little bit of a contentious relationship there, but he understands why it was done and he has respect for Shran, the person. And it was neat to see in the episode that Shran has so much respect for Archer, that there's this wonderful relationship between the two. And the way they portrayed it the entire episode is part of the reason I love this episode so much. From the first scene you see when the Enterprise discovers the Andorians are there pulling them out, and it goes to the view screen, and you have the back Archer's head, and you have yeah. the two blue <laughs> antenna that come yeah. up over Archer's head. Yeah, It's like the way they portrayed everything between that relationship is just so wonderful. And for me... This is where it's like the Star Trek fan fiction-y side of it kind of kicks in for me. Yeah, I love seeing how the Federation is coming together, how Andoria, Vulcan, and Earth are coming together. And this episode for me is like one of the linchpins of how it's coming together. It's like you can start to see right here why the Federation gets formed. It's like, yeah, yeah the Andorians had their ulterior motives, but they did come to help. They were the, coming to help, even though episode, they had their own motives. Yeah. This episode also does another thing that's really important to recognize. It's the first time that you see Shran in a room with a Vulcan yeah. where he doesn't turn to the Vulcan and, and just start barking at the Vulcan. Like you stand in our way. You're constantly pushing our borders. He doesn't do any of that. He's in the he room with her. Paul and he's like, yeah. we've now worked together enough that I don't view you as a Vulcan, he's even highlighting the fact that you resigned your commission. So in some level, he may even be thinking like, she's not really a Vulcan anymore. She's not part of the problem. We also then also for the first time see Shran's gap between him and the larger Andorian goal in the beautifully done argument that he has with the Andorian general played by Granville Van Dusen, who makes the statement you're doing such a great job. I'm going to give you a commission and a commendation and Shran turns it down and says, like, don't. <laughs> what are we doing here? He makes the point yeah. that his Lieutenant has made to him to the general saying like, why are we doing this in this way instead of just straight up offering support? Because this Alliance may serve us better if we don't taint it than what we're currently doing getting this weapon may not be the end goal that we think it is. And the fact that it's pulled out from underneath the Andorians the way it is by Archer, Mm -hmm. I think on a certain level, Shran may not actually, like you mentioned, Archer like is not holding any ill will. I think Shran Shran long-term might actually think this is better. Like he may walk slowly. Like they mentioned the ship is damaged and they're limping back to known space having rejected the offer of assistance in repairs i loved that little tease at the end like oh we offered Mm -hmm. them their assist our assistance but they said no thank you they're going home with their tail between their legs but i almost feel like shran may be returning with a this may ultimately be better like he's offered the olive branch of like here's some additional information which you might find useful I hope that we can still be friendly with an, uh, with one another or friendly enough in the future. And then he gets to go home and say, like, we shouldn't do that to the humans again. We're going to make another enemy. 
Like he, well, I can, it, it, the fan fiction part, you just mentioned the fan fiction aspect of this. The fan fiction part of me is Shran going back and telling his commanding officers, we almost started a war with another planet. And it's, we don't want that. Yeah. It, 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 it's what I'm really enjoying about that fan fiction part is there's the machinations of the faceless governments, the Endorian government, the Vulcan government, the human government. Yeah. That are all kind of clashing. But it's always, it's being done so well between setting this federation up of showing how it comes down to, for the lack of a better word, the human relations, the person to person relations are what's yeah. going to make it work. And it's, it's how you've got to Paul and the captain as the bridge between Vulcan and humanity. You've got now Shran and the captain creating that bridge there and the, the tightness of that relationship. And there's, there was two scenes that for me kind of crystallized how well I love what they're doing with Shran. I, every time Combs is on, I get super excited. Yeah. Cause I love Shran is probably my favorite character. on this entire little, little fun series. fact about the, uh, at this point in the show, Combs said yeah. that he had worked with the puppeteer who controlled his antenna and they created so certain, st- they created certain <laughs> staging. Yeah. Whereas in it the did captain's feel, room. it did feel very much like, early on in depiction of the Andorians, the antenna seemed to do their own thing without yes. much rhyme or reason. But in this, there's a brilliant moment where Combs turns his head to look at a comment and both the antenna swivel and point yep. at the person that he's responding to. It's this very natural movement to them as if they are no different than the eyes that they are swiveling in the same sort of way without any conscious effort. And I really, really liked yeah. the depiction of his, he's in the captain's, uh, the captain's room and he's walking and there's the bulkhead and his antenna go whoop. And we come back up again as he mm-hmm. walks under the, the thing. And it was like, that was such a cute little, like, I wonder yeah. how many times they had to practice that to get the timing. Right. Yeah. But it was so worth it. But the, the two scenes I'm going to bring up are, there was a scene between trip and Shran as they're walking through the ship. Yeah. And Shran is basically saying, I heard you lost your sister. And the two of them have this wonderful conversation about vengeance. Yeah. And it was great to see trip and show how he's evolved from, he wanted to go out with nothing but vengeance and revenge in his heart at the beginning of the season. And at this point he he's realizing that is not the path forward here. Right. We have to look at the bigger picture. And he says that to Shran and you can see that it's hitting Shran in a, like a, almost like a, I hadn't thought about it that way moment between the two of them of like, wow, I wasn't expecting that out of trip. Yeah. So it was a really wonderful moment, especially given how- that Shran's personal loss, which was, he reveals it was a brother who died yep. in conflict with the Vulcans when there were more skirmishes between the two planets. That death is much longer ago for Shran than trips loss. And I think part of it is that Shran is looking at somebody who is so recently lost his sister, having come to a calmer place so much faster. And I think Shran is a little bit like, I still carry around like my hurt. How do you, how did you not hold on to it in that way? I really like that scene too. But the willingness to also give the, that very proprietary technology. Yeah. Cause trip had asked for that like warp core or something or other. And yeah. he was like not willing to give it at the end of the conversation. He's like, I'll have that sent over. I thought there was just a nice character moment between the two of them. Yeah. And then the other one, which was just a uh, fun to see an Andorian outside of their comfort zone was the mining consortium scene where the Andorians <laughs> came yeah. flying into the Zindi and we're like, Hey guys, yeah. we scanned the planet and you know, don't pay attention to our scanning. We're, you know, it's omnidirectional. We're not actually yeah. scanning your ship. Sorry yeah. for invading your privacy yeah. and how they threatened them to get them to go away. And when he, he cancels the, uh, when the, the connection gets cut and he says, go the other direction, but don't go too fast. The mining, the Endorian mining consortium <laughs> runs from no one. Yeah. <laughs> it was just a wonderful moment because it was fun to see. Yeah. Here's Shran having fun. Yeah. It he's was making a joke. See him. Yeah. He knows yes. that he knows that Archer and his crew will appreciate the joke. Something that if these were Vulcans, you wouldn't have had you anything have like that. You might've had the yeah. moment of, of subterfuge trying to get the, the same thing, but he, the Andorians in this moment, um, you know, as I was watching it, I was just like, it kind of depicts that the Andorians have run into the Ferengi 
again, yeah. the fan fictiony part of it of my brain was just like, yeah, he's he's run into a few Ferengi and he's using a little bit of the the fast talking sales pitch that a Ferengi would use. And I really like it was funny to see because yeah. it's like that's not how Endorians would have ever handled that moment. No. They would have never done that. But yeah. The captain asked them to do it. Yeah. And so he did it. And he looked like he was out of his comfort zone a little bit, but he had fun with it. Yeah. And it was fun to see how the humans, once again, it's very human centric, but it's like how the humans are the center pillar of the Federation showing how they're kind of bringing the best out of all the people that are kind of coming in. It's yeah. like how they're impacting the Vulcans in a positive way, how they're impacting the Endorians in a positive way. It's like, you can start to see those seeds of the Federation coming in. And that's part of the reason I love this. It's like, as a Star Trek fan, it's like, oh, this is so cool to see these friendships being built, even though the Endorians are about to screw them over. It's like, there's still, you can see the, the building blocks of what's coming. Yeah. And it really does come back to, as I mentioned at the beginning, the idea of tethering, that they're all bringing each yep. other closer together with, there's a certain amount of hesitation, a certain amount of yep. the unknown. And the show for two full seasons was all about the unknowns between the Vulcans and the humans. And now here comes the Andorian element and the humans and the Vulcans are a little bit easier in their footing. There's a little bit more, even with whenever you've had the, the more recent episodes with the Vulcan ambassador who looks at Archer as like, I've learned, I can't tell you what to do. Like mm -hmm. there's a certain amount of easiness there in that relationship and the introduction of the same thing from the Andorian side to come in and say like, this isn't all about being best friends. It's in some ways more about making sure that you guys aren't going to do things that I don't like simply because we're now too much in the mix with each other. That kind of tethering. Yep. I, I really liked that little article I found around tethering. So listeners, what do you think? Do you think that this, I, I think I'm, I'm going to speak for Matt and I am going to be surprised if he disagrees. This felt like it really moved into a Star Trek territory that felt very familiar and very, very engaging. And do you agree with us? Did this feel like full-blown Star Trek to you? Or were there things about this that you didn't like? Let us know in the comments. Next time, Matt, we're going to be talking about stratagem. What do you think that's about? Strategery. It's a. It's probably all about strategery and maybe even yeah. a game of stratego. <laughs> Before we sign off, Matt, is there anything you'd like to remind our listeners about? What do you have coming up on your main channel? Well, I've got a video coming up probably about a week after this comes out of wirelessly charging your EV. I had a chance to visit a company that's got this technology that allows you to charge your EV wirelessly. That's going to be the future of where autonomous driving goes, vehicle to grid technology. It's, it's a really cool thing that I so desperately want on my electric vehicle, but it's not there yet, but it's a really cool technology. As for me, you can check out my website, seanfarrell.com. You can also look for my books directly at any bookstore that goes all the way from Amazon or Barnes & Noble down to your local bookstore or public library. Keep an eye out for my new book, which will be coming out next year. It's We're still a ways away, but it should be next July or so. And it's going to be The Sinister Secrets of Singe. And I just today received from my editor the copy edited document that means nice. I have to go through and take a look at what a copy editor has said about my ability to use the English language. It is usually <laughs> shocking and disturbing, <laughs> but I'm trying to prepare myself for that emotionally. What do you mean a <laughs> comma doesn't go there? What's a period? How do you use exclamation marks? Some of these things elude even people like me who've done it so many times before. Anyway, if you'd like to support the show, you can keep doing what you're doing right now using your ears and your eyes. If you're on YouTube, we appreciate the listening. We appreciate the viewing. You can also review us. Go back to Apple, Google, Spotify, YouTube, wherever it was you found this. Leave a comment, leave a review, share it with your friends. And if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to trekintime.show and click the become a supporter button. It allows you to throw some coins at our heads and we appreciate the bruises. And don't forget when you do that, it also makes you an ensign. And when you become an ensign, that means you get direct access to our spinoff show, which is out of time where we talk about not only Star Trek, but anything that passes 
are fancy. So we're talking about some of the new Star Trek programs. We're talking about some Star Wars. We're talking about other sci-fi fantasy programs that we're watching. Most recently, Matt was talking about the new Lord of the Rings show. Spoiler, it cost a lot of money. And we also <laughs> talked about Lower Decks, which, spoiler, is a lot like Next Generation if it was Rick and Morty. So yeah. we appreciate your support, and we offer you the opportunity to jump into that program as well as a thank you. All of that really does help support the show. Thank you so much for listening or watching, and we'll talk to you next time. <laughs> <laughs>